Welcome to this edition of Great Books, a lively discussion of a selection from the canon of exceptional literature. Here's your host, Jack Hatfield. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for the Great Books Show. I'm Jack Hatfield. Our panel meets periodically to discuss great works of classic and modern literature. Les will introduce our selection for today, an article by Robert Hutchins, The Great Conversation. Les? In this episode, we'll be discussing the founding principles of the Great Books Organization. As active participants in this endeavor, we are addressing a topic that is dear to our minds and hearts. The Great Conversations is the underlying basis of the Great Books Reading Program. It utilizes the Socratic method of reading, discussion, argument, all for the purpose of obtaining knowledge. Knowledge then leads to understanding, and that reflects our ability to make sound judgments. The use of dialogue is essential to the educational process. The great books and great conversations are ideas from several academic sources in the early 1920s. The implementation of these ideas are the product of Robert Maynard Hutchins and Mortimer J. Adler. Hutchins, January 1899 to May 1977, was an American philosopher, educator, lawyer, dean of the Yale Law School, president of the University of Chicago at age 30, chancellor of the University of Chicago. His tenure at the University of Chicago set a landmark in the direction of higher education in the United States. After leaving the University of Chicago, he headed the Foreign Foundation and later founded the Center for the Study of American Institutions. Hutchins served as the editor-in-chief of the Great Books of the Western World and gateway to the Great Books. Additionally, he served as co-editor of the Great Ideas Today, chairman of the board of editors of Encyclopedia Britannica from 1943 to 1974, and also published extensively under his known, own name. Comments by Hutchins speak for his contribution to learning. The death of democracy is not likely to be an assassination from ambush. It will be a slow extinction from apathy, indifference, and undernourishment. To put an end to the spirit of inquiry that has characterized the West is not necessary to burn the books. All we have to do is leave them unread for a few generations. A liberal education frees a man from the prison house of his class, race, time, place, background, family, and even his nation. To solve a problem, it is necessary to think. It is necessary to think even to decide what facts to collect. The object of education is to prepare the young to educate themselves throughout their lives. Jack? I thought for this uh, selection we'd go a little bit afield from our usual uh, adherence to the Great Book Foundation guidelines, which is primarily to for the text itself. One thing I, I noticed reading this that there was very little about fiction uh, in Hutchins' Great Book canon is at least half, if not more, uh, fiction than nonfiction. And um, I was wondering how he defines different terms. He talks about liberal education. Why? What's the the goal of it. Why should we read Shakespeare? Why should we read Dickens? I think he's addressing the issue of commonality and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, one of his arguments in here is that the school systems we currently have in place are more vocationally driven. And in the process of doing that, we're losing part of our humanity. And so the program officially is great books and they were determined by a group of scholars uh, that they felt contributed to what society but needs to know. But why read fiction? Well, I'm leading to that and the reason fiction is not as much a part of this canon but it is still important in the product of what we do because within the great books organization that Jack runs we are not just strictly adhering to the great books as outlined by Hutchins. Uh, we read all kinds of things and literature contributes another avenue of understanding that is beyond vocational or scientific. So it frees the mind to look at things through a different lens than just constantly through a scientific approach. Oh. He, talk, he talks about commonality and how it's right. important to have a, a common core of not beliefs because he says you can have a variety of beliefs, but of knowledge. And when you read something, especially fiction, you see the world through a different viewpoint, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I love he has a quote in here about it, 
you read it and you see the wisdom of geniuses sometimes and you incorporate some of it into your own lives and I think that's very true with fiction also because you're living the characters as you're mm -hmm. reading and you're also getting whatever message the author is trying to give you and I, I think of somebody like Ayn Rand I mean she wrote fiction but she was a philosopher and mm -hmm. she wrote yeah, those fiction exactly. books to get an idea across mm -hmm. instead of writing a political treatise and mm -hmm. so there's a lot you can get from reading fiction as well as nonfiction. But what about the, the Dickens and the Shakespeare's and and uh, well a lot of their stories are about life's lessons uh, I think that's part of what he's trying to communicate uh, you know his big subjects of philosophy, religion, and history. Uh, that's what he, and he goes back to scholars. I, am I correct when I say most of the, all of those books were written before uh, eight, uh, 1900, before 1900, right. and he's going back to scholars. Well, there's great friction writers are scholars. I mean, you talk about philosophy, uh, talk about uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn, uh, what's the author? Mark Twain. Mark Twain. I mean, Mark Twain was a philosopher. Uh, so I think fiction fits into to answer the question. And also, Shakespeare, he specifically mentioned Shakespeare as if you don't have a knowledge of him, you're losing something in society because it's part of our common knowledge, part of our common dialogue. And right. many references are made to that. But, but I mean, but it doesn't have to be. Both of you have already talked about commonality. Beyond that, why read Mark Twain? Why read Shakespeare? To learn. To learn what? Life's lessons. It also, I mean, it also enables you to imagine outside of the real world where, because in the real world, you're kind of bound by a set of rules and you're trying to find um, the end result based on the facts that are available. But in fiction, you're kind of free to think beyond what's available to you and imagine uh, how the world can be. And, yeah, uh, good answer. Imagine, there's a whole paragraph uh, in there where he uses imagine this. You remember that one? I wish I can remember the details, but it was all about imagination. There's a uh, quote that I really liked. A reader leads a thousand lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. That one. So, yeah. The one I love okay. was about work. That work is... Uh, it's not an end, it's a means, so you can lead a good life. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really Is that fun. the two reasons to, to, to do commonality, which, eh, <laughs> but, and also this kind of leading more lives? But listen to what he also says. He says that you, you need to read these to have a liberal education, and it's a good way to be educated. And then he says, what is the substance of this liberal education? It appears to consist in the recognition of basic problems. When you're reading a story, even if it's fiction, right. it's a it, you're put into a problem situation. Right. You have right. to figure out how to solve it. Okay, in knowledge of distinctions and interrelations in subject matter, you're getting a whole different viewpoint mm -hmm. about things that you're not currently coming across in your daily life. Mm -hmm. And in the comprehension of ideas, and you're seeing the world and you're seeing ideas through somebody else's eyes. Right, right. And so therefore, fiction can give you a liberal education as well as nonfiction. Right, yeah. I know Jack's a big reader of Sherlock Holmes, and so there oh. you have thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and you got problem solving, and it's yes. all rolled up in each story, and the end result is you're problem solving, but the uniqueness is the process of how you're solving the problem. This is not related to your question, but do you think he was a, an intellectual elitist? Oh, Hutchins? Sure. Yeah. No, yeah. no, he no said that mm -hmm. these yes writings no. were for the common man right. Right. and that they're open to everyone. Well, I was confused. Was he saying that everybody's got to read the great books? No, because there's a line in there, the books are the best for the best. No, no, no. <laughs> he was discussing the idea of democracy going along mm. with the liberal education. Yeah, right. Right? And he's saying a lot of people, a lot of critics of the idea of a liberal education instead of vocational or, or technological education say that 
everybody can't read these books, so therefore no one should in a democracy. Let's keep everybody equal. So, oh. and, he, and he said, critics also say that if we try to give a liberal education to everyone, we'll ruin it, we'll water it down, and therefore nobody will have the benefit of it. Therefore we shouldn't give it to everyone. And he said those were ideas given by the critics of liberal education, but he's mm. strongly in favor of right. it. He mm. thinks it should be open for everyone. Exactly. And more important, he said that the young sometimes don't get it because they're, oh, they're not experienced enough. Oh, I love his comments enough. about the young. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we have to continue right. reading and thinking and growing as adults. Yeah. One thing that the Great Books Foundation got its start uh, back in the, uh, I think it was the, f the early 50s or maybe even the, the late 40s, is um, all of the soldiers were coming back and uh, they had this great need for, for being exposed to ideas they haven't been exposed to. So they devised a program where you didn't, it could be a high school dropout and still get something out of it. And they used to have uh, things in Chicago, these big uh, uh, events discussing a book and then have 2,000 people uh, oh. watching it, so. If you go to the literature that is not academic, I mean, for my personality, the best book I've probably ever read is Moby Dick. And I belong to a book club and I told them I wanted to read Moby Dick and they looked how thick it was. and So they struggled through it and then when we had the dissection of it afterwards, the light went on in a whole bunch of people's heads because it's not just a story about a whale. It's a very, very well written piece of philosophy. And so you don't necessarily have to have the great books to teach this. You can get the same out of literature. And I think it's C.S. Lewis had said, we read to know that we exist. And fiction, too, mm -hmm. it shows you the ideas of how to live and it gives you an example right. of somebody actually living it, which is sometimes hard when you read a, a nonfiction book and you say, well, what does this mean? How can I, I bring this into my daily life? When you read fiction, somebody did, right. a, a character did. And it also kind of allows you to interpret a situation in different ways based on an individual's background. So if I were to look at it based on my background, I can imagine a specific line with my background uh, around that line. But the same line can be interpreted in a different way for uh, someone with an engineering background or, uh, or uh, philosophy background or things like that. So, and, and personal experiences. As there's, well. there's these transitions in life that, uh, you know, when we become an adult, when we get the job, when we lose a job, when we have a relative that dies, when we're finally facing death ourselves. All of those we are unprepared for in reading as you said earlier, can, can give us that sort of, we can see through someone's eyes that have actually, their characters have gone through that and understand how they have done it. Mm. Um, There's two quotes he has about the young yeah. uh, that I really enjoyed. The most important things that humans have to understand cannot be comprehended by the youth. Yes. <laughs> and the other one was, the great books do not yield up their secrets to the immature. <laughs> yes. And it also said that a lot of the time that the young spend in school is, waste, oh, wasted. is wasted. Well, it was interesting how he went through the eight years uh, of grammar school, four years, uh, and then he knocked off three or four years. He said, it's mm -hmm. take, uh, what do you think about that concept? Do you think we're in school too long? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I think a lot of what's taught especially in the early years, is drawn out so much that a lot of students can probably do it in a more compressed mm -hmm. time, yes. material, time frame so they can be exposed to more material. And right now, it's not yeah. for too many students. You know what's interesting to me is that liberal arts is slowly making a comeback uh, mm -hmm. in, today, in today's world. When you got a, you're familiar with Mark Cuban, Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Yes. Billionaire. Uh, well, you know, uh, he's saying that he's looking for people with liberal arts background because they know how to think. <laughs> they can think. <laughs> they can also a, write. Yeah. Yes, and they can correct. read. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot said about, uh, well, some engineers can't 
read and write. Yeah. You know, so special class. Uh, yeah, yeah, some specialists. Right. Why? Why does liberal arts give you more ability to think? It allows you to get into different fields, uh, which kind of broadens your thinking, as in not specific to a field, as in either, whether computer science or uh, physics or, or such. Uh, rather, it allows you to read various materials like physical sciences, biological sciences, and uh, uh, other fields as well. So it kind of broadens your knowledge to look at things in different perspectives. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. I, I would disagree with you. I would say think broadly. Because well, what Mark Cuban is saying, not not think. I mean, if you're building a bridge, you want an engineer right, or a mathematician, right? right? But it, to look at a problem from many different points of view, you should have been exposed to many different points of view. So you can think outside the box. But look at the broadly. subjects liberal arts addresses itself to right. versus specialties. I um, mean, a specialty is very narrow, yeah. okay? But liberal arts is asking the big questions of life. Uh, who are we? Why are we here? What's this all about? And each generation is asking that question. Mm -hmm. I, I think the point he's making about education is we have to continue yes. this great books and this yes. liberal right. education yeah. for every generation of, right. has to yes. pass it on. Right. But, but I also want to say that liberal arts also includes the sciences and math. Yes. Mm -hmm. You right. know, yes. what it doesn't include is engineering or you know pharmacy or it's law it's specialized yeah, yeah. Or the specializations yeah. Yeah. even well, isaac well, newton said my accumulation of knowledge and all the things he came up with he stood on the sh shoulders of giants yes so i mean he didn't get where he was without and he was you know he was a philosopher as well so. and that's true not only for science which is right. what he was referring to but that's also true for, for psychology and right. philosophy. Right. And how do you stand on the shoulders of giants unless you read them, right. unless, unless exactly. you've heard right. them, unless you study them? Right. And speaking of books, I love Einstein's quote, who says, the only knowledge you need is directions to the library. <laughs> 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 I thought that was a great Well, well nowadays it would be your <laughs> pad, your iPad. <laughs> he had one comment that I thought was interesting, taking a, a little different direction. He said that uh, we must be stretched. We mm -hmm. our minds must be yes. outside, yes. and having difficult works does that for us, which is a real plus. Oh, I, I love we, the quote. As Aristotle remarked, learning is accompanied by pain. pain. <laughs> right. 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 There yeah. is a yeah. sense in which every great book is yeah. always over the head of the reader. He can never fully comprehend it. That's cool. I, I like that. And, and I was having a discussion earlier today about do you have to read the great books in their original? I mean, do you learn more from reading Romeo and Juliet, or can you get it from West Side Story, you know, which is the, the same story modernized? Can you read an easier version? Instead of reading Shakespeare, mm -hmm. can I read the... Shakespeare in English, in modern English, as yeah, opposed right, to the Shakespeare yeah. in old English. Your enjoyment of West Side Story is greatly right. increased if you, if you know were, Romeo and Juliet. Right, exactly, I, mean, I, exactly. I agree. Oh. I, I'm Absolutely. thinking it might be an opening, yeah. uh, a way in for for people to whom jumping right into the great right. books might be uh, too painful. Too yeah. might, might be too painful. Yeah. So let me ask this question. The really, really great books are bedtime stories. Say that what? again. Oh. Really, really great literature, great books, is bedtime stories. But how do you how do you inculcate your children into reading? You do it by telling them stories. And in those stories are morals and ethics and all sure, kinds of stuff. Sure. Sure. They don't understand it. Their brain doesn't understand that. But you put the foundation in early. And hopefully that leads to them wanting to be curious and looking for other things later in life. In fact, Jack, years ago we used to have a fable or two in our career. Yeah, we did the Red yeah. Riding Hood. And, yeah, uh, right. And, uh, we haven't Snow done that White. in a few years. Yeah, yeah, we had all sorts of fun in that one. But also, look at the Lord of the Rings or the Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, which, which both have been made in, into popular movies. and. People have gotten access through the, these great ideas and great works of literature through the movies, mm -hmm. you know, and, and hopefully when they then turn to the books, mm -hmm. the books are, have more layers and are, are, are a deeper experience. But there's a 
easier way to access some of these ideas. And, and some of the movie makers, uh, uh, who did the Jedi? Uh, what's yeah, Star, yeah, Wars? Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he he took most of that, the first one from uh, Dante's Inferno. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, he. And a great portion of it came from Homer's Odyssey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so. and so you wouldn't know that unless you knew the stories of, of right. these great writers. And having maybe somebody hearing you say that now will go and read the Odyssey or maybe. Dante's Inferno yeah. and see, yeah, really? That's Star Wars? <laughs> well, Apocalypse Now, that. You know that came from Heart of Darkness. Sure. I mean, almost, almost verbatim, just yeah. about. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I thought there was something also interesting that he pointed on, and it's been a great deal of this essay talking about, is when people turned away from any ideas that weren't the result of experiments, mm -hmm. right? He he talked about that a great. Deal. Big time. The and, scientific yeah, method yeah. was applied to uh, things that it shouldn't have been applied. Well, right. Before people knew about the scientific method, they thought and they wrote great books, and then all of a sudden, you know, people turned away and said no because this wasn't part of a controlled experiment. And he makes the point that not everything, even some scientists, can't do controlled experiments. Right. You know, right. astronomers can't do controlled experiments. Well, right. uh, let's blow up this star and not that star. You know. They can't do that. They can just observe. But he, he also made the point that there's a quote by David Hume mm -hmm. saying that mm -hmm. you should burn all the books that don't contain numbers or, or yes, quantifiers right. or he, he the, the scientific right. method. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but that we would, would be impoverished. That would, that would eliminate poetry because poetry yeah. is not a scientific method. It would be eliminate David Hume's right. Right. stuff too. <laughs> Let me ask a question. One thing is ask. Uh, has asked me several times, do you want your doctor to be, to concentrate on science and, and medical knowledge, or do you want him to read um, fiction of the great books? I've got an answer for that. But Hodgkin you made the point that most scientists, very good scientists, also right, are open right, to literature, right, right. and that enriches them, and that's the kind of doctor I want. I don't want a robot in the future who only knows I, I, how to do the, yeah, I mean, the, the I, medicine. A lot of doctors face uh, end of life mm -hmm. and of their patients and, and uh, you know, have them be able to accept some, some limitations to their mobility or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if they just knew the science, that wouldn't give him them the knowledge of to be right. able to deal with it, it, situations like but that. The problem I hear most people with their doctors is not that it's that they don't know how to listen. They're looking at you not as a person but as a body, mm -hmm. and therefore they're not hearing what you say mm -hmm. is important to you about your future. They're just looking at, at you as a case, and yeah, I think that's it, one of the things I I harmful. think they're not teaching them in medical school, and I don't know if you can teach this, is a concept of compassion. I mean, they're there to solve a problem, and that the old saying goes, the operation was a success, but the patient died. I mean, you need to have some compassion as a person of medicine. Uh, why don't we go around? Why do you read fiction great books, or great books in general? Why do I read the great book? Oh, yeah. my gosh. Uh, well, if you're a reader, you know what a good book is a good friend. It turns out to be a good friend. And uh, uh, how many times you can't wait get to get, get, get you can't wait to get home to pick up that book again? Uh, well, uh, you know, I like reading mostly nonfiction. There is so much to learn. If you look at the great books, you know, uh, most of that is nonfiction. Okay, uh, and. If there's the only thing I think is more exciting than uh, reading is you know what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, tell us, Jack. What, what is that? <laughs> what about you, Marie? I like being exposed to different ideas, and whether that idea, those ideas, are in fiction or nonfiction, it expands my world. I can only mm. live one life. I only have one brain, you know. But I can read what other brains have invented and conceived of, and I love doing it. Yeah. Les? 
Uh, as a child, I used to ask a lot of questions, and my teachers told me to shut up because I was disrupting the class. And so, after I got beyond that, I found out <laughs> you, you there's so many questions, there's all questions. kinds of answers out there if you just look for them. <laughs> That's a good one. Cindy? So, I, uh, I'm interested in rational thinking and uh, how we came about to be with the scientific method. So, great books is kind of an avenue to all those knowledge, uh, how they came about to be with different fields and scientific method and all that. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I uh, like to read great books. Yeah. How about you, Jackson? I, I, um, one of the distinctions that uh, another article made was between light reading and in-depth reading. Mm -hmm. And one thing that our way of doing things is to not, is to take a small, relatively you know, 30 to 50 pages and really study it and then talk about it. And that kind of forces me to really examine it. And the discussion always adds so much more. Mm -hmm. So that some very, which I've kind of skimmed over in my first reading, and uh, then the second reading and the third reading means more. And then finally it sinks in. This is what this guy is wrestling with, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And once I, I understand what he's wrestling with, I understand why he wrote it and understand why I like it. Because most of those, those problems that they're wrestling with are my problems too, in, mm -hmm. in some way. Um, so that's kind of, uh, and I just enjoy it. There's another, did I, I, I'm really big into meditation, as many of you know. Um, there's been some studies showing that reading can uh, give you the same benefits or similar benefits and sometimes when I'm really stressed, um, you know, just picking up a book, even if it's slack book, you know, it's just reading and it just calms me down. Just so that kind of retreat from the world mm -hmm. for a little right. bit, a little bit of rest is, uh, is, is, I think, very valuable. It's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about before. We can immerse ourselves in the problems of the author, but we can also use that to retreat from our problems. So it's, it's both. So. Um, I've always wanted to have a show on why we read, uh, and uh, I'm finally glad we could do it. I wish we had another two hours. <laughs> well, one of the things he says is, by not knowing, uh, knowing the great books in history, by not knowing the great books in history, we are often deprived of the light that they might shed upon our present problems. Yes. And, and, and that's the story of history, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the show. Join us next time as we discuss another great selection. As Aristotle said, the best way to learn is to get together in small groups and discuss great ideas.